Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to CSIS. I'm Stephen Schrage. I'm the Shoal Chair in International Business here at CSIS, and I'm pr proud to welcome you to our launch of a series that we're having on what may be the most critical issue facing the world, what shape will the next global economy take, and what strategic ramifications will it have for the United States and the world. Make sure that and as we think about this issue, um, nothing probably looms larger than what kind of leadership structure and what kind of leaders will take this forward and develop a course for the world and for our countries as we face this crisis that we haven't seen in years. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the discussion for President Obama recently has focused on health care. But I think in terms of the overall historical perspective, how we handle this financial crisis and how leaders here and, and elsewhere deal with it will be how history looks back on whether we were responsive, whether we set the stage for further economic stagnation or, were, or actually set up for a financial crisis 2.0 or charted the way forward to more sustainable growth. And as we look at that, you know, the our global efforts in the G8 and G20, we couldn't have a better group than we have here today, both in terms of U.S. Sherpas that have led the launch of the G20 Leaders Summit, led the G8 after 9-11, uh, the transition in the 1990s post-Cold War, uh, reacted to the financial crisis, working with legendary Treasury secretaries such as Robert Rubin, uh, and particularly our panel here today from an international perspective. Because the G20 was a great recognition that the world had changed in key ways and that no nation could go with this alone and that we needed to broaden the scope of our efforts to include new nations on the international stage. So with that, I'm, again, I couldn't be ple more pleased to have the distinguished group we have here today. Immediately on my left, we have Ambassador Han Duk Su. And as I wrote last spring, uh, with Korea's upcoming G20 chairmanship, its leadership on FTAs, including the U.S. F Korea FTA that's pending, and its response to its own financial crisis and leading reforms, and its key role in security issues in what may be the world's most dynamic region of Asia, there may be no two nations who are at the center of such an intersection of interest as the United States and Korea. And we couldn't ask for a better representative as we deal with the, uh, the issues of the financial crisis than Ambassador Han, who was not only ambassador, but was prime minister, was a minister of finance and trade, covered basically every major base on the, on the important positions related to global finance and international trade. And he's also no stranger to the United States, having attended school at Harvard, where he got his master's and his PhD, as well as serving at the OECD as ambassador and coordinating with many of the other leading global economies. Um, he has awarded many medals, and we're very honored to have him here today. Uh, so thank you very much for, for presenting. And as the chair of the 2010 uh, G20, I think Korea has a unique perspective to provide on that, as well as your own personal observations on the way forward. Secondly, we have Ambassador Fujisaki from Japan, which has long been a strong ally of the United States in the G process, dating back to the original Gs in the 1970s. Um, he personally has an incredibly wide range of experience. And uh, like Ambassador Han, his experience with the United States goes very back, even I believe to, to was it middle school where you were in the United States, in addition to other periods of study, and has served at the OECD in a whole range of other capacities and as chair of the 2010 APEC summit, uh, the, the summit that will occur in the world's, again, most dynamic region, and talk about how uh, Asia is integrating with the United States. Uh, again, we couldn't ask for a better person to discuss those issues. And finally, last but not least, we have Ambassador Castellaneta. And I think the Italy uh, G8 that was recently held was groundbreaking in so many ways. Uh, it was over 40 countries. Uh, it represented the idea that you may need to pull different groups together to address different issues. And his role as a former Sherpa, as Ambassador Fujisaki, gives him kind of an unparalleled perspective on these different challenges that were faced. He's advised several prime ministers in a foreign policy capacity as their senior advisor, been a diplomatic advisor to the Treasury Ministry, and in addition, is, I should refer to him, I guess, as possibly Knight Castellaneta, because he, uh, he was honored as his country's highest award of the Republic of Italy, the Knight of the Grand, Grand Cross. So uh, we're very interested in hearing your perspective, again, personally, and then also coming out of that kind of landmark G8, where you think we go from here. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our distinguished panelists for opening remarks. I may pose a question that I'd really like to turn to the audience. Um, part of this Next Global Economy series we're trying to develop here in advance on a number of different issues ranging from rebooting trade to what security issues could undermine global recovery 
is not a series of lectures, but a dialogue. And I know there's so many talented people in the audience, so we look forward to hearing from you as well. So with that, I'd like to turn to Ambassador Hahn. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shradi, for your kind introduction. President John Hamley and many other distinguished guests, thank you. I'm very honored and pleased to be here. We are now one week away from the Pittsburgh G20 Summit, and at this critical juncture, I'd like to thank the Center for Strategic and International Studies for holding this timely seminar which provides an opportunity to review and discuss the goals and implications of the G20 summit for the world economy. CSIS has long been a leader in producing many excellent reports on important current issues that they pay tribute to President Hamley's vision and leadership. As an ambassador of the G20 Troika country, this seminar is also an invaluable opportunity to share the sessions and lessons and experiences of the former shepherds who laid the foundation for the G20 as a global governance system. After the global economy slid into an unprecedented economic setback, there was growing concern that this financial crisis might spill over to the real sector of the economy and we would enter the second Great Depression. However, what is different in its response between the current situation and the Great Depression in 1929 is that 20 leaders of the world's leading economies gathered together in Washington, D.C. right after the crisis and then again in London in April. They recognized the need for a bold and decisive action to address the financial crisis and agreed upon close coordination of major policies. Firstly, the G20 nations decided to actively pursue macroeconomic policies such as counter-cyclical fiscal and financial policies that will provide $5 trillion for the next two years. Secondly, the leaders agreed on ad adherence to the free market and declared a standstill on protectionism, refraining from building new barriers to trade or investment. Thirdly, the leaders also decided to enhance crisis management by expanding IMF resources and strengthen an early warning exercise. In addition, they agreed to enhance the emerging economy's participation in international financial institutions and financial stability board. The leaders also made a strong commitment to improve international financial institutions' governance, reflecting the changing economic weight of emerging and developing countries. Lastly, the leaders showed their commitment to support emerging and developing countries who have been hit hardest by the crisis. They agreed to ensure a total of $1.1 trillion in support of these countries. In particular, since the Washington summit, Korea has led the discussion on rejecting protectionist measures worldwide. The standstill declaration proposed by Korea has contributed to resisting the pressure to slip into more protectionist policies and, and identifying free trade as the driving force for the healthy recovery of the global economy. Having reached a substantial and detailed agreement during the first and second G20 summit, the G20 has firmly established itself as a main forum for discussing ways to resolve the global economic crisis. Fortunately, buoyed by the positive evalu evaluation of the G20 summit as having been a turning point for the global recovery, the leaders decided to hold a third G20, meeting, G20 summit in Pittsburgh on the 24th and 25th of September this year. Let me turn to the main agenda of the upcoming G20 summit. Even if the economic indicators throughout the world economy show signs of improvement, 
macroeconomic coordination to overcome the economic crisis will be the key agenda for the Pittsburgh G20 summit. It is premature to unwind the support measures the G20 nations have taken because the downward, downward risk persists amid the rising unemployment rate, unstable price of raw materials, and still lingering financial uncertainty. Until the recovery becomes firmly established, we should maintain strong policy responses. At the same time, we need to begin preparation for an exit strategy, heeding fiscal sustainability and signs of inflationary pressure. Considering that unwinding the policies of crisis will involve complex challenges of timing, speed, and sequences, there should be, cl there should be close coordination in preparation for an exit strategy based on common principles in order to prevent the world economy from sliding into a double dip. On, as important as macroeconomic coordination is, transition towards more sustainable and balanced growth is another major challenge for the Pittsburgh summit. Developing a common framework which ensures high, sustainable, and balanced growth will require both flexibility and cooperation from the G20. Flexibility because each country will have its own national trajectory towards sustainable growth. Cooperation because the crisis has taught us that national macroeconomic strategies developed in isolation can lead to dangerous imbalances. The Pittsburgh Summit is an opportunity for the G20 to launch a process to guide the global transition to sustainable growth, and Korea, together with Australia, proposed a three-stage process. First, national governments should develop their own strategy for recovery. Second, they should agree to deliver these strategies to the IMF and ask the IMF to report back on their consistency with balanced and sustained growth. Third, G20 leaders should meet in 2010 to agree on their responsibilities and the necessary actions to achieve this goal within the framework of post-crisis global economic management. For the sustainable growth path of the world economy, we also need to take into account various challenges like the aging society, climate change, and unstable price of raw materials, etc. In this regard, I'd like to point out that Korea has embraced low-carbon, green growth as a new strategy to lead Korea's developments for the future in moving beyond the conventional economic growth approach. Leaders in Pittsburgh might discuss and take note of the importance of low-carbon, green growth as a new engine of sustainable growth and commit to encouraging green investments and enhancing international cooperation on the development of clean technology. There is still more work to do to implement commitments at the Washington and L London summits, such as reforming financial systems, modernizing and ensuring resources for the international financial institutions, and supporting developing countries. International financial institutions reform is a fertile ground to produce many concrete deliverables for the Pittsburgh summit. In particular, fundamental reform is required of the IMF so that the fund properly reflects the cha changed global economic weight and promotes more balanced global growth. In this regard, it will be highly important to come up with a concrete roadmap for the quarter review to be completed by January 2011. Given the high level of attention that $1.1 trillion commitments received in London, we are happy to note that satisfactory progress has already been made. Pittsburgh Summit should work out a clean picture about how the increased resources will be utilized. 
With respect to reform of financial regulations, we should guard against the loss of momentum arising from the stabilization of the financial market. This is no time for complacency. In order to stabilize the financial market in the emerging economies, reform of regulations must focus more on assuaging the extreme volatility in the international capital movements and exchange rate. The G20 has firmly established itself as a main forum to produce substantial and detailed agreements on overcoming the challenges of the global economic crisis. The G20 has demonstrated its capability to represent the perspectives of both emerging and advanced countries. As the G20 has demonstrated its capability to represent the perspectives Perspective, uh, as, as its management efficiency in dealing with major global economic and financial issues. For these reasons, I would say that the G20 is a representative and legitimate forum to steer the global economy. As such, it is crucial for us to make the G20 an ongoing process. In this regard, Korea shares the view that the G20 needs to hold another summit after the Pittsburgh summit to address crucial post-crisis management issues and to ensure the follow-through on previous commitments. As the chair of the G20 finance ministers meeting for 2010, Korea would like to host the next G20 summit in 2010 for the following reasons. First, as one of the G20 Troika, Korea has actively contributed to the G20 process, proposing measures such as the standstill pledge, principles of impaired asset management, and liquidity supply for developing countries at the Washington and London G20 summit. Second, it would be natural for Korea to host the fourth G20 summit since it will chair the G20 finance ministers' meetings and deputy meetings in 2010. Third, Korea can bridge the viewpoints of developed and developing countries since it has the experience of developing from one of the poorest countries in the world to attaining the status of an OECD member country. I hope Pittsburgh Summit will be a total success and with the success, the global economy can continue its path towards full recovery and prosperity. Thank you again for listening, and I would be happy to answer any questions uh, afterwards. Thank you. Ambassador Fujisaki. Thank you very much. Uh, the notice I received was, uh, please try to limit yourself to 10 minutes, but uh, uh, having a uh, Giovanni, the Italian ambassador, next to me, he was my co uh, Sherpa colleague uh, at G8. I thought, uh, and he's leaving, terminating his job in uh, uh, a few weeks. I thought I'll give him my five minutes, so I'll limit myself to five. So, uh, uh, Dave, uh, two days ago I was uh, giving a speech, and the title was uh, Japan, Changes and Continuities. Usually you would expect that uh, I would uh, say that there's at least some changes in Japan. I didn't do, have to do that this time. <laughs> Today I would uh, just limit myself to three points, uh, G20, climate change, and APEC. G20, a uh, year ago, a lot of even pundits in this town said uh, we have to relook at Bretton Woods, really review the whole system, and uh, I was a little doubtful. With hindsight, I think uh, there was a bit of exaggeration, but we are not that bad now. And, but this is thanks to G20 initiative. I think U.S. took a lead, and that was great initiative to have G20 uh, summit meeting in November, and uh, it was followed. Uh, and uh, I think uh, this group of uh, leaders have given the one point a confidence 
uh, they assured people around the world that they're caring, they're trying to cope with the issue, and that was the big thing. Uh, in this coming one, uh, we'll be discussing uh, uh, bonuses, uh, uh, BIS, and uh, these are BIS. Uh, these are not that difficult for us to uh, support because uh, some uh, Japanese uh, business leaders said uh, the bonuses of uh, Japanese uh, corporate uh, CEOs are about two digits smaller than uh, uh, a well, certain country. I don't have to mention. Uh, uh, as for, uh, I'll just so say G20 has done a great job. How to uh, uh, use G20 from now on, continue, whatever, that's uh, leaders to uh, decide. I was uh, G8 Sherpa with uh, Giovanni and uh, uh, Al here, and uh, we worked together. Uh, and uh, 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 I thought uh, I, I thought I saw a good colleague over there as well, but uh, and uh, some, a lot of American colleagues. And uh, at that time, uh, I thought G8 has two merits over other uh, uh, summits. One, they were coping with political issues, non-proliferation or uh, uh, terrorism, and more deeply than any other. Second, because the number are limited, they, they had a real deep ex exchanges amongst the leaders, and uh, I thought that was good. Second, on climate change, uh, the new incoming government is uh, trying to take the position uh, that uh, uh, our goal for midterm will be far more bigger than the, what we have been doing. Uh, the uh, previous government uh, goal was 15% uh, cut from 2005, and uh, 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 Waxman Murky was 17% come 2005, but uh, I think uh, uh, what uh, we'll be doing is uh, nearly double those, uh, uh, and it has not, I think a uh, new prime minister will announce this in uh, uh, New York, but uh, what uh, he has been saying before becoming the, uh, in the government was uh, a very big number. So uh, let, I think the, uh, uh, this is uh, what uh, some Japanese uh, companies were uh, concerned because uh, they think that uh, it's a little tie, too high. Some uh, industries think that this is a golden opportunity. In 1970s, we met uh, oil price hike, and that really made Japanese uh, economy more efficient, so uh, we should take it. So it's uh, not one voice in Japan, but uh, one thing I can say is that, uh, according to IEA, uh, public investment in energy sector is done by two countries mainly, 70% by two countries, U.S. and Japan. U.S. 30%, Japan 40% in public investment in the energy sector. So I think the two countries have special responsibility and special also possibility to uh, realize a lot of uh, uh, contribution in climate change to bring about uh, uh, progress in uh, COP15. Uh, three, on APEC, we have regarded and we think it's very important because U.S. is involved. Uh, it's the only real pan-Pacific uh, community that uh, we are discussing, uh, we are, have uh, been continuing, and uh, this year especially is uh, convening Singapore, next year is Japan, and uh, next year after next is U.S., so we hope that uh, we can uh, carry a torch uh, in between Singapore and United States and uh, have a very meaningful one. It's not, it should not be really only uh, a technical issues that should be discussed, but we have to really uh, focus on strategic issues as well. Uh, that's about all I have to say. Thank you very much. Ambassador Castellaneta. Thank you very much. I hope you do not uh, need to have uh, this extra five minutes uh, because what is important is to have a uh
contribution of all of you about to, uh, to discuss and solve, uh, try to find some solution for <laughs> a new architectural and uh, world architecture future. Because I think uh, uh, important is that, uh, yeah, th there are some, some day that changed the world. is the Berlin Wall, the 9-11. The last one was the global economic crisis, I think, last, uh, last year. This uh, was an acceleration of the, uh, of the process of uh, reforming the uh, international uh, architecture. And, uh, but that was the last uh, point, I think, the uh, international architecture needs to be reformed because it was uh, conceived uh, 60 years ago, just after the Second World War. So you have the political institution, the United Nations, uh, NATO, you have the economic institution, IMF, uh, World Bank, and so on. So there are a complex of uh, institutions that perhaps uh, after 60 years uh, uh, need uh, some uh, great reform uh, taking in account the, the, the world that has been changed, there's some uh, rising power, there's Asia having a different uh, role, uh, Europe, uh, Latin America, and then there's new, uh, new teams that were not, uh, uh, after the Second World was not yet tackled as uh, climate change, uh, food, uh, environment, and uh, so on. So I think uh, we are not to, uh, to focus a kind of a competition uh, between G8 and uh, NG20 uh, or some uh, national pride. We, had, uh, we still have the G8 presidency, but, uh, and then you have the G20 presidency that uh, will change next, next year. But uh, I try not to limit, uh, and not, uh, not at all to, uh, to avoid that there's any, any competition. Uh, all this must be considered as tools to face the crisis and to, find, uh, to reach uh, a result. The important is uh, the effectiveness, the accountability of uh, uh, international institutions. And uh, uh, what perhaps uh, lacks on the G8, for example, is that uh, there is not an accountability year after year. So we, uh, we decide, we, we, uh, we write uh, <laughs> uh, hundreds of pages that nobody really reads. There is not a binding uh, uh, decision. And then, uh, so I think uh, um, from the perspective of the Italian presidency, we tried, uh, not as a because we are president, but because of the uh, effectiveness of the institution to, uh, to organize a, a GA that could be a response to the, to the crisis and uh, also helping other institutions to, uh, to find a, a solution to the uh, uh, different teams that we are, uh, we are facing. We have a good record because Italy uh, organized on the uh, the G8 on 2001 in, uh, in Genoa. Uh, for the first time, I think, we, uh, we opened the G8 to some African countries, some, uh, some uh, less developed countries. And so that was uh, when we launched for this uh, Global Health Fund that is still working in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Geneva. So this year, after in uh, the L'Aquila G, uh, G8, that is not anymore, uh, G8. <laughs> uh, we um, we try to uh, uh, so find some new solution and uh, to uh, to open uh, the uh, the debate to other countries and uh, uh, to uh, so there was a different kind of uh, meetings that uh, at the end uh, included 40 yes, around 40 countries because we had the G8 plus uh, five and then. Uh, together with Egypt, there was a, and then uh, there was a discussion to open also to Turkey, to Indonesia, there was, was another two big countries that perhaps could be uh, um, included in this uh, G8 plus, uh, plus something, as uh, I think President Obama said once, I think the last one is that it's not, uh, not always excluded, that is always in uh, critical between, uh, uh, toward the, the, the formula of a G, G something. But in, uh, um, in L'Aquila was this, uh, the G8 meeting that, uh, uh, in a certain sense, uh, is a forum that uh, has proven to be very uh, useful to, uh, to debate uh, uh, teams and, um, and issues that 
on a basis of a, a, a shared vision. That is the, the main point of, uh, of G8, where having a, a country to, uh, no, which uh, share the same, uh, the same vision, the same political and economic vision, open to uh, other countries that uh, have a, a greater, greater responsibility in the, uh, in the world arena. And uh, uh, not forgetting other countries that can give a contribution to, the, to solving the, the, the problem. And the problem is uh, now, uh, this last year, we are focused on the global uh, financial uh, economic crisis. But that is uh, as not, to, uh, not to forget that there are other issues that uh, seem now a bit uh, uh, far away, but they are still uh, present. Uh, we don't talk anymore about... Uh, Food, for example, food uh, security, food, uh, uh, food need, and uh, that is very important for many uh, for many countries. We, yes, we, we, we talk about uh, climate change, environment, and uh, uh, health, uh, basic basic health. But uh, um, uh, so the, the the meeting in Laquila try to focus not only on economic global and new global economic governance but also on other issues like those one and so we um, uh, we uh, we ask um, leaders from uh, African countries to, to come the U uh, Union for Africa and so a series of that you know better than me a series of countries that uh, uh, took part to this uh, to this meeting. So uh, our contribution as Italian presidency that we still have until the end of this year is to, is to uh, contribute uh, to build this new uh, global architecture that is not uh, a work for uh, uh, six months, one year. We, we, uh, we have the same architecture since, since uh, 60 years, so we perhaps still we, we need some more time to uh, uh, to find a new solution. G20 is a good solution. G20 because it's a, it was a, an immediate response. It was a tool that we already had uh, on our hands, so that's uh, easy to, uh, uh, to, say, to, um, to rise at the level of the uh, uh, chief of uh, head of governments uh, from the normal uh, level they, uh, they had in the last year, so the finance, uh, finance level. But I think it's not as some uh, uh, good uh, aspect, but perhaps it's not, as many say, so representative as uh, could be. So I think it's more kind of first response to a crisis. We consider as a kind of a bridge, perhaps, to a final or definitive uh, solution. And perhaps uh, having some competence at other uh, institutions will not have. So it is uh, always uh, a bit on uh, working progress. Uh, uh, you are not to stuck just in one, one solution. So uh, as we imagine as uh, Italy, as G8 is a kind of a club already as some value added that has been uh, uh, proven uh, along the years, but perhaps it's not any more uh, uh, sufficient to, uh, to give a, a response to the so many problems with the present world. G20, uh, it's an uh, immediate response that can need to be uh, refined and perhaps uh, to, uh, to focus on the competence. And then, uh, if you have time, <laughs> talk about UN, NATO, IMF, World Bank, uh, OCDA, and, uh, and so on. That is a, it's a great task that, uh, I don't know, we are always pushed by the uh, emergency of the problem. Uh, this year has been the economic uh, uh, crisis. We hope that uh, we, uh, we are rebounding from, the, uh, from this crisis and starting in, uh, uh, a, new, a new period of better growth, anyway, stopping the, the decline and uh, starting a new, uh, a new period. And then facing the other problems I was uh, uh, listing uh, before. So I'm very interested to know also what you think about all this problem and together to, uh, to give perhaps a contribution to the, uh, the solution. Thank you very much. And uh, by the way, uh, no, in fact, I'm leaving in a few weeks, so I will be in Rome uh, in, in October.
you are, you are all invited <laughs> to, <laughs> to see me in, uh, uh, in Rome, but the uh, United States for me is really a second home. I will uh, come as often as possible to Washington, to the rest of the United States, and uh, I know that I have many friends here, and you have a good friend, a great friend in Rome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ambassador Kesselin, I think you may have many visitors from the audience, given how beautiful Rome is, especially that time of year. So thank you very much. I think the ambassadors have done such an excellent job of covering such a comprehensive range. I'd just like to turn it over to our, our audience, because I know so many people have such great experience and, and interesting questions. So I'd like to maybe start with the individual, the man right there in the third row, please. Thank you, Mike Miyaza. I've got a question for Ambassador Fujisaki. At the first G20 summit here in November last year, the Prime Minister of Japan, former Prime Minister of Japan, pledged that Japan is going to extend a loan of $100 billion to the IMF. Uh, as everybody knows, there was a change of government in Japan yesterday. So I guess my question is, does this promise by the former Prime Minister of Japan still stand, or has there been any change? Uh, uh, that uh, uh, commitment was uh, extended, and I think I have not heard of any uh, changes. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Ernie Pree, the Manufacturers Alliance, just the fact that the U.S. manufacturing industry, we project, will decline by 16 percent this year. That's related to a position I understand the United States will take at Pittsburgh, namely that the United States can no longer serve as the import of last resort during recovery when others can pursue export-oriented growth. It's particularly related to China where the big imbalance is, but my question here is rather, uh, assuming the U.S. takes this position, in Pittsburgh, will we get the support of others, such as the Europeans, Japan, South Korea, to some form of commitment that recovery should not be based on export-oriented growth that would lead to a bigger U.S. deficit and, and, and in effect, be a, a real challenge to any recovery in the U.S. manufacturing sector? I, I think uh, you raised the quite relevant uh, questions. Uh, as we recover from uh, this uh, global economic crisis, we know all very well that last four years or five years of rapid growth, mainly due to export, uh, actually uh, will not be the real momentum, may not be the real momentum for growth in the future. That means, I do not mean that the role of trade is, is, is somewhat downgraded. <clears throat> trade is still very important uh, in pushing for growth. Uh, it's a really uh, interdependent world, and globalization will certainly work in that way. But we know that the overall aggregate demand of the world will certainly be less than the bubble years. So the uh, Pittsburgh Summit uh, has one of its top agenda for G20, which includes all the relevant countries, including United States, China, India, Korea, Japan. And they, are, they will discuss on what will be the high, stable, sustainable growth framework in the future after the crisis. That is very important. It includes a lot of macroeconomic policies, uh, but also some kind of, a, uh, you know, how to enhance the uh, potential growth rate uh, which will require some kind of structural reform, a balancing between the domestic and, uh, and the uh, you know, external demands, and also some kind of rebalancing among the major players uh, on the global economy. So they will discuss. There are some suggestions. Uh, Korea, Australia uh, proposed some three-stage, some kind of solution for that, and there's also some uh, proposal by Germany, the Charter for Sustainable Economic Activities, and, and also there are one uh, proposed by United States as the framework for uh, sustainable uh, 
uh, economic growth. So all those are not quite apart from each other. They can find some kind of a common denominators for making the global economy more sustainable in terms of growth and, and, and the, the increasing the standard of living of the global citizens. As a European country, just as a, our position is uh, that when we can't just rely on the American market to absorb our products, uh, so I think our commitment will be to, uh, to have a fair world market uh, in which uh, uh, the, any tendencies to protection can be uh, avoided, and uh, at the same time having uh, an open market so we can uh, also uh, uh, buy and sell our products all around the world. And uh, of course the uh, American economy is still the biggest economy in the world, so uh, it must be uh, it's important for us to have a fair exchange. And, uh, but uh, um, the important is the basic thing that is a uh, uh, the world has be, must be a, an open, uh, an open world uh, for our products uh, produced uh, on uh, uh, without, uh, uh, you say, to change the rules of a competition. So without subsidies, without uh, uh, some other form of uh, um, inside the helping, as you say. So it's a, that is the what. Uh, the ideal world. We hope that we can <laughs> reach at least <laughs> some form of this, uh, uh, this ideal world. Thank you. Sir Fujisaki. Uh, yes, uh, just two points. Uh, I agree that uh, uh, countries uh, around the table should uh, commit themselves to uh, uh, increase domestic demand. Uh, set point two. Uh, they have to uh, commit themselves not to introduce protectionism, and uh, that's to not to go down the slippery slope as well. Uh, these two has to come hand in hand. And uh, I was looking around the uh, room, and uh, yes, I thought uh, I saw my good uh, colleague Sherpa Gary Edson as well, who worked with me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think there was a question up here in the third row. Thank you. Um, thank you, Patricia Lerner. I'm a senior political advisor with Greenpeace International, and I have a question for Ambassador Fujisaki. Uh, thank you for your comments about the new Japanese government's midterm targets. I mean, definitely are to be welcomed, and this may well be a game changer for the uh, negotiations under the UN framework climate convention. Uh, as you well know, there are only three weeks of negotiating time left, and as it now stands, the industrialized countries and the developing countries are very far apart. There's very little trust, and finance is considered to be key to breaking the deadlock. So climate finance is on the agenda for the G20 summit in Pittsburgh next week, and yet, in discussions with people close to planning for the event, everybody's downplaying and lowering the expectations for what will come out of that. And so my question to you is, is there some way that the Hatoyama Initiative might invigorate the discussion and try to get some, some uh, recommendations coming out on governance and scale and mechanisms of finance so that this can inject some momentum in the talks? Thank you. Much for a good question. Uh, first, uh, uh, the new prime minister has to make his uh, position uh, known in New York. Uh, what uh, he said was uh, before uh, becoming prime minister. I think uh, that would, but uh, that of course will be reflected. He said, uh, "Yes, we'll aim at 25 percent, uh, provided other countries would do that." But uh, uh, that was not as a prime minister. So let's see what kind of priority uh, 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 position he will take. As for the uh, Pittsburgh uh, finance issue, we. Uh, 
have uh, been uh, supporting to take up this uh, financial issue in the climate change, and I think that position will not be changed. But uh, as uh, someone has uh, said, uh, the new government has come in just yesterday, so it's a little too early for me to sort of explain the position at this juncture. But I'll try as, try as my, my best. Um, in, the, in the third row, or fourth row from the back. Hi, uh, my name is Ira Strauss. Uh, I appreciated the comments of the ambassadors. Uh, in particular, I noticed there were some comments which justified the existence of the G8, and that's a change compared to most of what we hear uh, in public discussion and international discussion, and I wondered if you could pursue that a little bit uh, with regard to a couple questions. Um, first, uh, the G8 is under attack not just for what it does or doesn't do, but for what it is, that it's the rich, industrialized countries. Is it wrong or right for the rich, industrialized, democratic countries to talk with each other? Is there a good thing in that, or are we the bad people of the world who really shouldn't talk to each other? I think that ought to be addressed directly. Uh, if you think we're not so bad, it might be worth explaining why, because there's an awful lot of discussion based on the assumption that we are the bad guys of the world. Uh, Mr. Lula has given voice to that, for example. Second, regarding the related issues of OECD and IMF, should the OECD be abolished as an institution of like-minded first world countries, or is it worth keeping it that way and not letting in every uh, large third world country also? And regarding IMF and governance, uh, is it true that the world balance has shifted? The main shift I can see in the world balance is that the Soviet Union no longer exists. That has been the one really big shift I've seen in the lifetime of these institutions. Regarding OECD or the first world's weight, it is greater as a part of world GDP than it was in the 60s or the 80s. So I don't see this shift. I wonder, is it real? Isn't the IMF already giving some weight to PPP factors in its weightings, which already distort the balance somewhat toward the third world? Would it really be advisable to distort it further compared to the actual economic weights? Those are my several questions. I think, I think those are interesting questions. I think one of the dynamics that he has touched on is the tension between elite organizations and selective organizations versus representatives. So I would love your thoughts. Uh, I will just uh, make myself uh, short uh, because there were three big questions. I'll take just only the first one. Uh, I, as, I thought there was some uh, uh, reason of existence, uh, raison d'être, in uh, G8 in coping, for example, with uh, infectious disease, debt relief amongst uh, those donors. And uh, that was only possible if uh, donors uh, try to coordinate their position. But uh, uh, they're, they're, of course, I know that there are some different views as well. But uh, I'll just limit to my first point. Anyone else want to share We've got time maybe for two more questions. I'd ask if you could please keep it to one question given the time. And I'll take them both and, and then ask you to comment on, on the two questions. Um, why don't we go, the, the, the woman four rows back there. Thank you, Xiong Ming, a Chinese reporter from 21st Century Business Herald. The question is also about trade, but more looking at the short term. The first um, important trade policy decision that President Obama has made is to impose a tariff on Chinese tires. And this has raised, uh, raised concerns worldwide of a possible trade war in the future. So I want to hear from the ambassadors. Uh, do the G20 leaders, should the G20 leaders uh, made a stronger commitment when they meet to assure that a trade war will not happen and to assure the world against protectionism measures? Okay, thank you. One additional question, please, if we could take it at the same time. Right here in the front, the gentleman on the right. Hello, Robert Charetta with International Investor. I was surprised we didn't hear much at all about financial reform, regulatory reform. Uh, can you each comment, is there a single reason why we won't believe that another crisis could unfold in three or five years 
it seems as though the G20 has taken very little action in this regard. What do you hope to get out of Pittsburgh in terms of concrete proposals that will prevent a crisis in the future? Either or both of those questions. Ambassador Hahn. I think on the uh, some kind of uh, financial regulations which may prevent some of the uh, uh, recurrence of the crisis, I think the agreements made on, in Washington and London are well underway. Uh, there are some other issues which need uh, further consultations, and G20 uh, is very active in, in making those consultations uh, leading into some concrete results. And there are also some institutions engaged in that, and I think in that area, I think G20 can make some consultation, uh, very good results. The question is, if we agree on that, then how that, will that be translated into domestic actions? Sometimes the domestic actions is not very clear and sometimes diverge from what we agree that at such a forum as G20. That is another issue that we should deal with, including all multilateral financial institutions to know that. Uh, can I comment on this uh, uh, trade point? I think, uh, as I have already said, uh, I think uh, leaders uh, have to take a strong position on uh, not to introduce uh, protectionism. At the same time, uh, it's very unlikely that G20 leaders or even myself would uh, comment on anything that is happening in bilateral context or individual cases because these have to be discussed with facts and findings uh, and uh, without uh, having those as a third party, usually you would not do that. Thank you very much. Yes, as you know, the uh, uh, European Union is uh, try to, uh, so the, the basic position is to, uh, as I said before, uh, open uh, markets, so we are against wow. the protections. But we, we have to understand what is for, what what you intend for an open market is a market without uh, any uh, hidden subsidies, uh, uh, no unfair uh, commercial practices. It's not just a question of uh, the final price of a product. It's what is, uh, how you, you, you get to form the price out you put on, on your market. So when you say open frontier, open border, it must be real open, not just uh, the final say, uh, or imposition of uh, taxes. That is our concept of, uh, of uh, a free, a free trade and a free, uh, and a free, uh, free market. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank all of our ambassadors here, and I hope you will join me in thanking them for their excellent remarks and also for their leadership on these issues over the years and, and helping address the crisis and chart a way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you.